Well, good afternoon and welcome everyone. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. This marks the first of our Dean's Lecture for Dean's Lectures for this academic year. And it's a real privilege and honor to welcome Jessica Lesson, who is the founder and CEO of The Information. Jessica founded The Information about five years ago. Uh, it's an online subscription-based uh, journalism newsletter that covers the tech industry. Uh, for those of you who haven't checked it out, I highly recommend it. Uh, I think it has offered, certainly has brought me an enormously greater understanding of uh, the trends, the forces, the ideas and technology today, as well as a really thoughtful and detailed analysis of venture capital. Prior to founding The Information, Jessica was a reporter for The Wall Street Journal. She covered some of the tech giants, Facebook, Google, Yahoo, um, and was also a part of the team that in 2012 was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize for their coverage of privacy issues in tech. Certainly a timely issue for today. Now, I invited Jessica here today because we are seeing so many areas of intersection between consumer-based technology and sort of traditional uh, commerce-based tech and healthcare and biomedicine today. And I think that Jessica's perspectives and the perspectives in the larger sense of what's going on in tech has a lot to teach us as we being an institution surrounded by the big technology companies, explore more opportunities and really explore how to make digital health both consumer-facing devices and technologies as well as AI-enabled analytics, how to make digital health really work to the benefit of health, healthcare, and wellness. So Jessica, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real honor. Great. So we, uh, a lot of coverage, of course, uh, on issues related to freedom of speech um, in, in some of the bigger social media companies like Facebook, as well as uh, really important issues about privacy. And uh, you've covered that a lot in the information. And I'm wondering if you could start out by sharing your perspectives on maybe a bit how we got to where we are today and what you see in the future of how some of these very important debates uh, will be resolved, and where they'll be resolved. Will they be resolved by the government or within the community itself? Just a, you know, a narrow, narrow question to yes, be right, right. We're getting the whole right time into the that. big stuff. But no, um, you know, we're absolutely at this um, new tension point between freedom of speech and censorship, really. Right? But, but um, uh, and, and we see this with the social networks where um, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter are under incredible pressure to police their platforms from fake news, um, really objectionable content, you know, to really create these communities. Um, but every time they do so, they're, um, you know, really challenging free speech with, with every sort of intervention. And uh, it's remarkable to me, we, I think in just recent months, we've seen a huge shift in the posture of the tech platforms towards this issue. So for years and years, um, they were open platforms. They, uh, you know, weren't responsible for the consequences of that, um, and it was a very idealistic sort of mission that a lot of tech companies held uh, to to not interfere and to be these these platforms, these sort of neutral arbiters. And I think what happened in the last political election, uh, U.S. presidential election, and many others. Um, and just the fact that so many more people and bad actors are using these communication tools and manipulating them, um, they've swung to the other side. And they've said, you know what, we're um, going to use AI to really tr try and police to unprecedented degrees um, and to really assert, you know, not just our terms of service, but, um, you know, get this objectionable content off. and and. Um, in many ways, I think that's good. I mean, I, obviously, we don't want platforms to be manipulated. Um, we don't want, um, you know, some really objectionable stuff. And we've seen some horrible use cases of what can happen. But I think we're not thinking enough about a society about the free speech implications. And I think about a lot of this in my industry, the news business. Um, Facebook has started working with third-party fact checkers to fact check news because they're um, under huge pressure to deal with the fake news that proliferates. And 
Um, you know, dealing with third parties is sort of a cop-out, but as a journalist or even as a citizen, do I want Facebook sort of curating in any way news? You know, that is a very powerful company. I, our publication writes about them all the time. So uh, these things are in fundamental tension. Technology has sort of put all these, collapsed all these issues. Um, you know, we're seeing them just sort of uh, in, in all come together around uh, pretty much Facebook now, but YouTube and Twitter as well. And, and I think what will happen is what we're seeing, which is the government saying, uh, the company saying, look, we are under so much pressure now from the government to do something. It has now become politically expedient for the right and the left to attack um, uh, social media and the internet broadly that um, they're going to play ball. And I expect what it's going to mean is that a lot of content will be pushed to other places. We, we've seen and wrote about um, a blockchain company that is, so it's a competitor to YouTube. I mean, it's tiny. It's not no way a competitor, but it's a video sharing platform. Um, and it's run on blockchain technology, so it can't, in theory, be censored. And we saw some Alex Jones videos that were kicked off Apple and YouTube and Facebook show up there. And this is accessible on the internet too. So I think that will be the consequence that we'll see um, you know, more content pushed to other places. But um, we're going to have to think a lot about, um, you know, I don't think we're anywhere close to being a China in how we think about this. But with each step that the tech companies are saying, okay, we're going to enforce these rules and we're going to police very aggressively. We're, we are starting to move in that direction. You, you mentioned China and, and you now have an office in, in China for, for the information. A um, lot of tech investing in China today. Where, um, the crystal ball that we all have, where do you see it going? And in particular, um, are we going to see you know, the Alibabas, the Tencents, actually becoming dominant forces outside of China, which I gather today they're, they're principally in China, right? Yeah. What do you think the future is of, of Chinese internet-based companies? I think the future is still sort of two internet. It's, I mean, I think the U.S. and Chinese internet ecosystems are parallel tracks that while there's some investment that crosses over and sort of co-investors, um, the climates, the products, the whole markets, I think, are very, very distinct. And, you know, we're seeing, again, Google try and dip its toe back into going into China. I'm sure they'll do something. I'm sure it won't matter. Um, so I think that uh, for a host of reasons, you know, the China Internet market is big enough <laughs> to support um, incredible growth for these businesses for a long time. Um, and... So, and you just haven't, you know, Alibaba has actually retreated from many of the initiatives it sort of tried in the U.S. Where it's interesting to look at sort of the competing head-to-head -head U.S., China, and the rest of the world. You know, India is um, a hotbed of competition right now. Southeast Asia, South America, uh, in ride-sharing, in, in sort of the Uber versus Didi battle. Um, our team has actually did a map of the sort of spheres of influence of those two companies globally. And um, Didi crushed Uber because it's bought companies in Brazil. It's invested in companies pretty much everywhere else. So I think that's interesting to watch. But um, when it comes to the internet spheres, I think they'll be different. And in technology in general, one thing to watch right now, we're watching very closely with the trade war is, is what's happening to sort of the components piece of the technology sector semiconductors and the like. Um, China was very dependent on that from the US, and now Chinese companies are investing heavily in, in doing their own. So I think that's another sign towards greater separation. You've written a lot about and covered uh, women entrepreneurs, and each year you do an analysis of venture capital firms in terms of how many women they have, or in most cases don't have. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts about diversity in tech and what needs to be done to to change the face of tech? Uh, it's still very poor, obviously, and, and I think it's um, sort of, ch you know, we're not seeing a lot of movement. So we, we've done this study for uh, three or four years now 
um, and uh, we look at um, gender diversity and ethnic diversity, and um, you know it's pitiful. And I think we all, you know, this is a very commonly talked about theme in the valley. Uh, and one thing that has changed is I think, in part because of more public pressure around it, you're seeing companies and investing firms um, sort of talk about it more and, and um, in some cases bring more diversity to their ranks. But when you talk to them about why they're doing it, I think they're doing it for the wrong, they're doing it because it's bad publicity not to do it. So um, I guess on one hand, at least they're doing it and maybe we can develop that muscle a little bit over time. Um, but too often I hear the, it's a pipeline problem, well, widen your pipeline. Um, or, you know, there's this incredible pattern matching. You're looking for someone who's done a very specific set of things and you think that's the only person who will succeed. So um, I'm heartened that the public pressure is, seems to be there and people sort of responding to it. But, but I think, you know, you're just not seeing the numbers and, and women sort of moving into the leadership. So I think we have to sort of now address a couple rungs down, okay, what are the causes of that? And um, companies are starting to do that. You know, they're starting to think more about women re-entering the workforce after having children and what those next couple years look like. Um, I think that kind of stuff could help a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, returning to this issue uh, about public trust and the challenges that have come about in terms of public trust, in the case of Facebook and other other social media companies, you know, it's, it's on our mind in in biomedicine because we now have this incredible opportunity with most health information being digitized, at least in the United States and increasingly around the world, um, and with the opportunity really to uh, perfect our ability to make diagnoses, to establish the best care delivery pathways, to really personalize uh, the healthcare we deliver, that opportunity has never been greater than today. And yet, we see that health, healthcare, biomedicine has been disrupted far less by technology and data than any other sector of the economy. Um, and one of the challenges that we have is not really in being able to develop the algorithms, that, that can be done, but it's being able to bring together the data that enables the algorithms to learn and to be effective and accurate. And to bring that data together, we've got to, it's data about individuals, and therefore, at some level, it has to have the public trust um, that it's gonna be kept private and it's gonna be used in a responsible way, and that in the end, everyone will benefit from it. But I think it's a challenge right now to know how to go about rebuilding that trust. And um, what are your perspectives? You've covered uh, what's been going on with, with Facebook a lot. Um, and what can we learn from that? What do we need to make sure that as we try to build and extend this trust and aggregate data, that we don't make uh, missteps along the way? Yeah. I think one lesson to learn from what's happening in consumer internet and Facebook is um, how much how you architect the system actually matters. Because if you look at the challenges like Cambridge Analytica, um, that's really a function of all the data being turned over to one company and to their servers and sort of leaving it up to them to know exactly how that data is used. And of course, you can know how it's used, but then you can be misled by those people. And, and um, so, you know, because of, you know, centralizing things on the internet makes them really efficient, it makes them really fast, it allows you to run those machine learning algorithms um, you know, the whole model, the, the sort of Google, Facebook, um, and consumer internet is very, very centralized, just in, in how it's sort of built. And it seems sort of wonky and technical, but I think it really matters because you can't, for instance, you know, when people say, I want more control over my own data, in a very centralized world, that basically means you, they still have control, but you're relying on them to give you access. But there's a lot of relying on the other parties. So, I think one of the interesting things to think about now is both for consumer internet, but also for other industries that want to um, do better on trust, where trust may be even more important, um, like the medical world, what other architectures um, 
could sort of facilitate that. So though that we don't just have to take sort of one company at their word and hope that their systems um, sort of keep their integrity. You know, a lot of people talk about the blockchain. It, it's definitely an overused um, sort of framework, but, but at its core, it's saying, you know, building a system where um, you don't have to trust one centralized thing. You can trust a lot of decentralized nodes um, and that that record um, can be used to uh, validate a contract or many, many other things. So I think that's one model. Right now it's very, very slow and that's a, the big problem. But, um, you know, I, I think it's a sort of, it, it's a tricky place for the medical industry because um, obviously, there are benefits to centralizing that data. We want that to happen sooner to bring the benefits. But um, I think if, if there are smart entrepreneurs and institutions that are thinking about ways to not follow this sort of internet-like architecture, um, they'll pay dividends down the line. Great. So Amazon, Berkshire Hathaway, and JP Morgan came together to found this company. Um, uh, thoughts about uh, first what it's going to do, uh, and then the impact that it can have. You know, I, what we hear and what our team hears is it's just sort of moving slowly. Um, I think, you know, they recently announced Atul Gwande as the, the head of it, um, but there doesn't seem from entrepreneurs we know who are sort of knocking on their doors to try and do business with them or to learn more, um, they're not getting a lot of information. So I think that it has tremendous potential to affect how employees sort of experience healthcare from sort of through the whole process. Um, it's you know obvious why these companies are taking it on. I mean, I, I I think Amazon maybe I think it has half a million employees right now, and its current trajectory it will have a million before too long. And if you just start to think about what that means, um, so I think it, it's a nice. Um, sort of marker that companies want to be competitive on this and innovative, but it, it seems from what we hear to be moving slowly. Right. You know, we have this vision, particularly living here in the Valley, of companies that begin in garages and then become these enormous uh, uh, behemoths. Uh, with the rise and the growth of the Apples, the Googles, the Facebooks, has it become more difficult for the young entrepreneur with an idea um, to be able to make that idea into reality because, um, needless to say, these companies have enormous resources to invest and enormous talent. So is it is it harder to be an entrepreneur today than it was 15, 20 years ago before Google was Google and Facebook was Facebook? Absolutely, in the consumer internet. Um, and, you know, I think... It, these companies um, with these attention traps that they've built and they're getting um, greater percentage of time spent online, greater percentage of ad dollars. Um, they have incredible resources to recruit talent. I mean, that's one of the things we hear from startups over and over again. It's just we can't compete with the offers these guys are given, huge signing bonuses and the like. So um, I think what you've seen is that you've seen a shift in startups getting created and funded to out, you know, when's the last time we saw another photo sharing app? I mean, I'm actually thankful for that. I think we had reached peak <laughs> photo sharing app. But, um, you know, I talked to investors who were investing in, you know, e-cigarettes like Juul, uh, cannabis, um, biotech, you know. Um, and I think that um, there's definitely a recognition among investors that you need to kind of look beyond what these guys are going to do um, we've seen a number of interesting startups in enterprise software. Uh, mm -hmm. I think following the slack around productivity, uh, uh, there are a number of companies that are sort of surprising me with their growth rates there. Um, but at some point then you do run into Microsoft. Um, so we, we definitely are in that phase. And one of the interesting maybe counters to it a bit is that the amount of money going into private tech um, venture capital is just still going through the roof, though. So um, there, there's a ton of resources for companies to continue. Um, they have a long runway to go up ahead against these companies. But um, increasingly, they're just trying to 
sort of get out of their lanes, I think. Sure, sure. Well, we, we have wonderful turnout today, and, and we have microphones uh, on either side here. We would welcome uh, your questions. Sure, that's fine. Thank you very much. Hello. Hi, thanks very much for coming today. Um, I'm a master's student here at Stanford, and I wanted to ask um, regarding your comments on censorship. So even if Facebook and their like didn't curate content before, for a long time they curated the flow of content. Um, Zeynep Tufekci, who is a sociologist that talks about this topic a lot, defines censorship as, quote, not a denial of access, but a denial of attention, focus, and credibility. Mm -hmm. So the spread of misinformation always happens faster than the corrections that come after. I don't think there are more strict controls on free speech, just um, that the new changes make it clear that there are multiple methods of censorship that Facebook has employed, according to the definition. So I wanted to know sort of what your thoughts are on how to control misinformation, if not through these new methods. Um, I think, I mean, I, I think that approach Facebook has outlined makes sense to me I, in the sense that they're going after, um, they're going after sort of policing accounts. Um, they're going after cutting off financial incentives um, and, you know, for those account holders. But I think that seems like very low level, um, you know, where the stuff becomes complicated is where it's not sort of, where it becomes subjective and gray area. So it's very easy to say, here's a photo claiming to be a person X that's not a person X. Here's a photo saying this thing happened, it just didn't happen. You know, um, there's the whole realm of just highly objectionable political speech. Um, and, and I think I don't have a solution to how you, um, sort of deal with that. I, I think one of the challenges, I, I go back and forth in my head between can you sort of exist in the middle? Like, is it better to say we're sticking to one end or the other? Like, going full, here's what's allowed, here's not what's allowed, that kind of thing. Or, you know, it is what it is. Um, and you can't really do this what it is because there are laws that prevent you from doing that. So, um, you know, I, I don't... Where, from where I sit in running a newsroom, I think the way journalists can help the problem is just creating as much high quality information as possible so that we're increasing the quotient of that in the world, but that, that doesn't decrease um, the fake news, and, and I, I think it's just a really tricky one. And I, I don't think there's a silver bullet, I just believe we have to sort of think through the consequences of whatever path different companies take. Thank you. Um, speaking a little bit to that question, I'm a fellow with the John S. Knight Journalism Program here at Stanford for the year. Um, and a lot of our fellows end up, like you, branching off and starting their own uh, media companies to try to solve some of these problems, however they define them, but broadly misinformation. Um, can you speak a little bit about how you decided to move in that direction and how you think it's going so far? Sure. Um I started the information for two reasons. One was that I felt the business model in news was broken. Um, uh, to this day, but especially five years ago, online advertising and clicks were really the, the currency of anything digital. So even at the Wall Street Journal, my editors were counting the page views of my stories. They were you know, praising me when I happened to write a piece about Apple that just had more clicks, right? Even if it wasn't a very good piece about Apple. So. Um, to me, you know, the business model shapes the product. And we were inundated with a world of news that was designed to just sensationalize and capture our attention. You know, subscription media um, only works when you have something so good that people will pay something for it. They can pay a lot, they can pay a little. It, were, it doesn't have to be a premium kind of product. Um, but to me, that was clearly, um, should be the primary model for news. Um, and uh, because all the publishers had Google and Facebook envy circa five years ago, no one was betting big on that, and I wanted to bet big on that. Um, the other opportunity I saw was that 
coverage of the tech sector, I think, was flawed because it was often run out of New York, and it was seen as like, oh, those wahoos in Silicon Valley. So you got a bunch of stories that were, can you believe this company's worth this much money, not how does this company work? How does they make money? What's their product like? And I felt that instead you should sort of, you know, instead of just, you know, parachuting into Silicon Valley and having um, the core DNA of the publication be about something else, if you build a publication that knew technology well, you could cover the valley well, and over time you could cover every industry well because every industry was um, transforming and paying a lot of attention to tech. So that idea of building, you know, a tech newsroom that, unlike where I came from, the journal, their finance was kind of the DNA. So every reporter took a course on how to read a cash flow statement, right? You know, what instead if every reporter had to have a fundamental understanding of deep learning? you know, how would their coverage be different? So um, I, uh, you know, you have those big ideas, but at the end of the day, you, you know, you're like, okay, we just have to write stories and we have to hire great journalists who want to write um, great stories and prove to them we can be a better place for them to do that work than at a newsroom where they're being told to kind of churn out multiple page views a day. So yeah, five years in, we have 36 people um, we're profitable, um, we're growing quickly. Um, we have offices in Hong Kong, New York, San Francisco, and LA, and um, I'm very excited, but um, you know, also daunted by the fact that we've got to continue to cover and cover ahead of the curve, um, you know, these big companies and these big industries at, at a really exciting time. But um, you know, highly uh, encouraging of anyone who wants to go in this direction. And, and we started a little incubator two years ago where we actually help back um, journalists, particularly who want to start news organizations. And um, if anyone's interested in that, we'd be happy to talk about it. Great. Great. Yes. Thank you so much for coming today. I'm uh, Scotty Fleming from the Biomedical Informatics Program here, PhD student, just starting. Um, I really appreciate your comments on uh, responsibility around journalism. And I think one of the things that <clears throat> I often perceive around the technology sphere is that there's a lot of hype. Um, I was wondering if you have any thoughts or opinions on whose responsibility it is or who owns the primary responsibility of maybe tamping down hype and tempering expectations and establishing reality about what technology can and cannot do, whether that falls primarily in the scientists or primarily in the journalists or primarily in the public. Um, you know, it's interesting. We, we've been doing a lot of uh, reporting around autopilot um, and Tesla's autopilot in particular, but a lot of um, car companies are now um, building this fairly advanced technology, I think personally overhyping it. And they're overhyping it to uh, customers, to the public. Um, and so while I think the media has an important watchdog role to play, um, obviously the companies themselves are, are hugely in control of how their technologies get used and adopted and propagated. And I, and I think there needs to be a lot more attention on how um, to ensure that they're not overhyping it. Um, you know, autopilot, where I think I'm going to publish any day now, is a story about it and just looking at um, what the company, like what the company's actually telling drivers versus some um, other basics. So uh, I think companies do need to pay more attention. Um, and then reporters have to, um, you know, have to come in at the right lens. I mean, I, I think for many years it's starting to change a little bit, but tech was covered as the latest, greatest shiny object. And that was what sold. So it just was sort of perpetuated. And I mean, you saw this with Theranos to an incredible degree. Um, and you know, it took a reporter who had a very different lens, a very different background, was not based here um, to kind of see through that. So um, it is definitely a part of the res responsibility of the media. But I think the, the companies need to um, you know, they're, they're going to get in hot water pretty fast if they don't align expectations with their technologies, I think. Yes. Uh, hi, my name is Kristen, and I'm a coordinator in primary care and population health. 
non-technology question, but as a female founder, I'm really interested in hearing your opinion on this new California law, which requires women on boards, corporate boards, um, because uh, is it, in your opinion, just like a high level kind of band-aid solution? Because you mentioned uh, the pattern matching and winding the pipeline and how there's actually levels to before you get to the corporate boards, or is this kind of like a trickle down, like incentivized uh, version of encouraging companies to build those levels in? Yeah. Um, look, I, I think it's by no means like a solution, precisely because of what you said. It 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 just it, it's cosmetic in many ways. Um, I'm at the point in believing that the cosmetic stuff is worth doing because it will, again, sort of build this muscle memory, get companies, even if they're not doing it for the right reasons, um, it will cause them to say to their recruiters, I need to look at a bigger pool. Um, so yeah, by no means something that we should celebrate as like solving this or a Band-Aid. And you know, I, in an ideal world, I, I think you'd prefer to have a system where you didn't need quotas for this kind of thing. But if it can help prime um, awareness and action, I'm in favor of it. Yes. Hi. Um, I, was, I really liked all the discussion on all the points. There was one thing that I'd like a little bit more insight on is the patient privacy about their data and how their data is used. There was a story recently about Sloan Kettering and their use of AI uh, with histology slide sets. And wondering just sort of what your opinion is on what they're doing and how some of the founders of that company are employees and benefiting from that in uh, how they get their money, and then how Stanford, who also has a very rich set of data, should go about using that. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I mean, first principles, I think consumers should be told exactly how their data is going to being used. I'm not actually sure if that happened in this case or not. Um, but, uh, and given the choice for it to be used or not used. Um, and to be clear about, this is a for-profit company, this is um, not. Uh, you know, I think that the, we need the data. Um, and so I'd like to see um, companies and institutions figuring out ways to, to sort of aggregate it that are really transparent. Um, we had talked earlier about stuff Stanford is doing where, um, you know, Stanford might spin off a company related to um, a particular um, technology, but also make the data set public. Um, so everyone has access to the same, in this case, radiology images. Um, and you hope that maybe 100 companies might bloom off that. I mean, that seems like a really smart way because if commercializing the technology will be, bring huge advantages to patients eventually. So I would hate to, to sort of cut that whole thing off. Um, but I do, yeah, I mean, I think part of it, and again, it gets sort of technical and I don't really understand, but um, that level of it, but like if we're gonna continue to see the same kinds of problems we saw like with Cambridge Analytica, if the way the companies are getting this data too doesn't change as well. Because imagine what happens like, okay, I trust company X with it, um, but you know, company X may make a decision that you don't agree with, or they, and they may make a decision you do agree with, but then that partner becomes untrustworthy. And, and all of this stuff, it's, not, it's really the rule rather than the exception. Like one of the amazing things about Cambridge Analytica is like, it was sort of the straw that broke the camel's back, but I'm sure that happens a lot more than people realize. So um, I hope that people are very, very transparent with what's happening, but then also just think through, like, I mean, the number of, like, personal health vaults that have been tried, I don't know, is probably, like, a graveyard of them, but, like, is there a way to really ensure that you're giving certain control and not giving other control? And, um, and maybe there are models where consumers can benefit financially from... Um, you know, sharing their data with companies. It's an idea that's often floated in consumer internet, but no one in consumer internet cares that much about like what their Facebook photos are worth to whatever, but, but you could see maybe the calculation being different in medicine. So that would be an interesting idea.
Hi, I'm Moni Farhadi. I'm a senior planner in facilities, but I'm not here to talk about facilities. I'm here to talk culturally, sort of about the intersection between data and culture. I'm Iranian American, and what you only see in data and news is sanctions and nuclear and trade travel ban and um, prejudices against people of other cultures. So all the artificial intelligence and data being collected is going to just grab those news. Um, why aren't why can't data also grab our rich cultural heritage, our architecture, our respect for ancestors, our our traditions of celebrating spring? Um, how we love our family, which is true of any other culture. So I'm a proponent of spreading positive energy in media and social so that for generations to come, when they look up Iran or Iranians, they're not going to find that stuff. They will also find all this other beautiful stuff, uh, which is true of any other culture that's been prejudiced against um, or, or being Muslim, same thing. I'm a modern Muslim, not, not a traditional, but I don't mind... Uh, learning more about the values that we all have and respecting each other's culture. So in a place like Stanford, which is the United Nations, um, how can we also help spread the positive in data about other cultures? You raise a totally excellent point around um, sort of what can happen when AI you know, just the, the narrowing and filtering effects of AI. And, and I think that's not discussed enough in general um, because, you know, we, we also say, we throw around AI very broadly, but, you know, AI right now is basically machine learning, which is pattern matching on steroids. And so pattern matching on steroids is going to just get you more of the same by definition. So I, I think one thing I hope is that, um, you know, there, there's no shortage of AI ethics boards around the world that try to think of how to mitigate some of that. Um, I hope they're successful because I think that could be a really big problem. It could lead to a lot of homogeneity in a lot of things. Um, as for surfacing alternative narratives, I, I think it's a role where, where I hope journalism can play a big part. And one of the reasons I think I try to be vocal about the business opportunities in news, even though um, there are many negative headlines, is because I'm hoping that entrepreneurs and um, people with different stories to tell um, see the, the models for them to do that sustainably and as a profession so that um, we, we are just getting more perspectives. Um, and so that would obviously be the professional angle of creating that content. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of organic and social ways to do it as well. But, but I think um, one of the, you know, the news industry, you know, laid off. We, we lost about a 500 newsroom jobs last year, which is a lot. So we have, you know, 500 fewer journalists in the U.S. than we did. But um, to me, there's no reason that that's the case because the barriers to entry for being in the news business have never been lower. It's been easier than ever to find interested readers and an audience and to build a business. So to me, this should be like the golden age of, of journalism. And I think there are particular opportunities for um, underserved areas. So that would be a good one. It seems like one, um, one thing that needs to occur, and perhaps it is, is that um, Consumer skepticism needs to grow. As you pointed out, machine learning is fundamentally pattern recognition. <clears throat> if there's a lot of fake news out there, sufficient volume, it's going to get amplified. Yeah. And, and I guess there are ways of tweaking the algorithms, but probably in parallel, it's, it's, it's getting a more informed and perhaps skeptically minded consumer base. And, and maybe, maybe that's occurred before. I mean, there was a time when in earlier days of journalism when a lot that was put out by even the major news organizations of the time, say 50 years ago, was sort of yellow journalism. Yeah, we, don't, we don't see nearly as much of that today. I think the sort of the, but partly I would presume the reason we don't see it is that there's a consumer expectation that's perhaps different than it was 50 years ago. And I wonder if we don't have to build that same consumer expectation uh, or skepticism regarding some of the amplification of fake news. And then, if so, then how do we get to that? Yeah, um, a lot of smart media literacy people, I know, think about that. Um, you know, all sorts of programs to get inside of schools and, and the like. Um, 
I think we're we're up against a real headwind in that, which is just how powerful an attention grabbing machine these consumer internet companies are. Um, and it's you know Facebook, Instagram, YouTube are sort of wired to like get in our brains and have us click more and serve us more of what we want and um, you know, it's a very different model than here's a bunch of stuff that you should like that is interesting and will broaden your perspective, right? I mean, uh, that is fundamentally, I think, at odds with trying to build a ad-based attention-grabbing machine. So, um, you know, I think you've seen pockets post the um, U.S. elections around, you know, you saw a surge in subscriptions at the Washington Post and New York Times and also, I think there are signs that consumers are thinking a little more thoughtfully about it, but um, I haven't come across anything where I thought, you know, that, yeah, that, that could kind of really change the equation. But it's an excellent point to point out that the sort of proliferation of fakes and all that is nothing new or garbage. And, um, you know, you do tend to see then sort of a couple players that emerge that have a better reputation and put that away. So... I think we can hope for that. <laughs> yes. The pace of tech is legendary, and certainly for those of us who uh, are now interacting regularly with the big tech firms to uh, really realize some of the potential of, of digital health and related technologies, it's it's a it's a different world. Uh, and part of that is, I think that that um, unlike uh, one of our scientists has a great idea. Um, they'll file a patent, publish a paper, and they have some protection uh, to take that idea, move it forward in a company. But in tech, it's my understanding is that it, there are some things that are patented, but by and large, the, pers the entity that gets it first and most decisively in front of consumers, that is so that consumers embrace it, is going to be the entity that wins. And so there's this feverish push to um, keep the engine running. And is that going to abate, or, or have you seen it change? You know, in your experience reporting both the Wall Street Journal and now the information, is as the pace remained pretty constant? Is it accelerating? Is it starting to slow down some? Um, what, yeah. what do you see, and what do you what do you expect for the future? So I think it goes back to your question about the power of the big tech companies, and I think it sort of goes in cycles. So you see, sort of. Um, a period where you have a new fundamental innovation, maybe it's mobile, maybe it's machine learning, uh, and lots of flowers bloom. You know, someone achieves some sort of network or scale effect, which is really one of the only things that's unique about that you can do in technology and not in other industries. And then they kind of run away with that advantage. Um, and you're right that they even they could sort of copy something somewhere else and just be more effective with it. I mean, Facebook has sort of snuffed out Snapchat um, just by d doing that. But then it, it's a cycle. And so then what you see is um, the big guys, the Microsofts of the last era, I think some of the big internet companies now will um, either regulator regulators will intervene or they'll just miss something. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll miss the next platform wave. Um, and, you know, I, I don't see that cycle being any different now, but we're, we're just at the sort of peak, maybe the peak, maybe approaching the peak of, of the power, I think, of the big guys who can, um, who can just, with, I mean, two billion users that, that are, you know, basically daily. I mean, it, it's just a level of data and the size of a network um, that's very, very hard to compete with. But, um, you know, there's a million things... You know, Facebook is still ultimately a, a very narrow in, in the products it has and, and what it does. And, um, you know, they will unden undeniably be disrupted. You just don't know when and by what. So maybe you guys know. Maybe that's why. That's great. Um, yes. Yeah. Thanks, thanks so much, Kevin Schulman, a new uh, faculty member here in medicine. Um, looking at the tech companies, you've been talking a lot about consumer and their consumer insights. Um, I'm sure you've seen a contrast when you go to the physician between our pen and paper and uh, asking a lot of very simple questions and the, what they would do. What are the skills that they have that we need to learn about you know, engagement with consumers, about marketing, 
we probably didn't send you a message about treating your cholesterol or making sure you're exercising, but Facebook probably did too. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, I, um, there are a bunch of startups now that I think um, are doing really interesting stuff in this space too. So I, I'm a member of Forward. I don't know if you guys know, but just a um, uh, healthcare company. They have physicians' offices, but they also have like a messaging app and um, can get uh, can get data in real time very quickly. So I think there is, um, and, and they're just one of many doing great things around that. Um, you know, the, the thing that makes tech companies work is just this sort of very rapid iteration cycle, um, you know, testing, trying, not working, and doing that at scale over and over again. At least in consumer internet, that's what works. Um, that sounds a bit scary when applied to medicine in, in some ways, but, you know, maybe there are parts of the process um, where that's sort of less scary. Um, I think the other thing, if, it's interesting if you actually look at, I mean, the biggest trend in consumer so it sort of recently was, was messaging. Um, if you look at the rise of WhatsApp, um, enterprise Slack, I mean, consumers' expectations around communication and real-time communication and small group communication um, have shifted demonstrably. And, and you know, that may be one area where there's um, things to learn about the medical field. I mean, I love, you know, calling my doctor, waiting three days, and getting, you know, and she call me back with this time, and if you miss, you, like, I don't know how to call her back. You know, that's, like, really frustrating. Um, but I think, um, so that's one example where consumer behavior shifted, I think, dramatically. But the the overall, um, you know, again, it, it's it's very problematic in certain parts of the field, but sort of move fast and break things. <laughs> Um, is a mantra for a lot of tech companies. Um, and um, also being, um, I think another criteria is they measure everything. Um, and, you know, these companies are just so instrumented so that they can pick, okay, we're going to dial up that number, we're going to hone in on that number um, to really an unprecedented degree. I mean, I, when I was covering Google, I knew that they were going to make their earnings every quarter because they could just change the font size of the paid ad words and change their revenue in a huge way. So it was never a question of whether they're going to beat earnings or not, right? So that mentality, um, I don't know how it might apply, but um, is something I think runs deep in tech. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, I a question that's kind of linked to that uh, regarding health. And who, if you see, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit seeing like if the responsibility of being healthy is shifting with those new companies because between uh, you know the, your personal responsibility like what your doctor uh, does with you and what public uh, like public policies also do and now companies like tech companies maybe come in the market and they have they have some incentive as well I'm, I'm just wondering if you have like some thoughts about like is the responsibility of keeping the population healthy changing with mm. those new tech um. I guess it, 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 in many ways it's probably broadening in that there are other stakeholders um, who are getting involved. Um, I think we want to make sure that as some of these new entities get involved in health that they're actually doing a good job um, and that we trust them and that we don't assume that they are. Um, Theranos is another example. So I think we, we need to be skeptical. Um, you know, it, it, your question also raised, I don't think this was your point, but also just like technology is probably making us less healthy <laughs> um, and mental health and all of that. And do, do companies have responsibility to mitigate that? Um, I was talking to the head of a big e-sports network, so people watching people play video games, and um, someone asked him, just to be clear about what e-sports is, and he's going to say, and someone asked him if he feels a responsibility to promote healthy exercise among kids. And he said, well, we, we do. And so when we're um, celebrating an athlete, um, we'll have like a promo video for them as they're entering the arena, and we'll show them exercising. And this person was like, but the, the exercising is no bearing on like playing Call of Duty or whatever. But they were like, they thought that, that just showing this person being active somehow mitigated that. So. Um, I think that's something we also have to be on the lookout for. Um, and in a great world, like the responsibility could, you know, we could have more entities 
trying to contribute to making us healthy. Um, but yeah, we have to be skeptical of um, claiming that they are and, and looking for the ways that they aren't. Yes, great. Hello, uh, Eris Lazens um, in the School of Medicine. I had a question, um, have, we haven't addressed it yet, but McKinsey and others have come out with reports focusing on the challenge uh, or uh, the consequences rather of uh, technology and, and employment. And I wonder how you're thinking about the issue of, of job displacement by uh, tech. It's a, it's a complex issue that I'm, I'm curious if our, uh, if our government and of policy is going to be able to keep pace with how quickly this is all happening. And I'm wondering if you might see uh, other countries perhaps responding to it in different ways, perhaps China specifically. Mm -hmm. I'm not as familiar with um Actually, I didn't think about the China one a bit. Um, it's obviously a really huge issue. Um, I think I see all these reports come up. Obviously, there are reports. Um, I haven't seen anything that seems like it's looking to address um, the kind of retraining that needs to happen. Um, I recently was talking, I don't know if you guys know Kai Fu Li. He's a Chinese internet investor. He just wrote a book about. Um, the differences between AI in China and AI in the US. And um, it's really fascinating. And he also outlines um, what jobs he thinks AI is going to displace and which ones it won't. And he sees um, an opportunity for a huge surge in what he calls empathetic jobs and creative jobs. So jobs where you know caregivers, uh, elderly caregivers is a great example. Um, these are not going to be jobs, he argues, that will be replaced by technology, and they're jobs where we'll see um, a huge need and a huge increase. So uh, if you look over the course of history, there will be huge disruption, there will be huge transition, but, but there will be new opportunities. Um, and I think, you know, it, right now we're in the phase where the tech companies are sort of afraid to fully acknowledge, I think, the extent of the disruption. So... Um, you see, you know, years ago, Travis, who was then the CEO of Uber, was celebrating the day there'd be no drivers in the vehicle. Um, now that was a very controversial position to take. So now you see companies sort of slow rolling their expectations for that. Um, but I think uh, we'd be much better off if we were also thinking about, okay, what are the jobs? And I, and I think, I guess I'm optimistic about the jobs that there will be. Um, because that's just sort of the course of, of history, but it, that doesn't mean there's not going to be a very, very painful transition. It's also very hard to predict the timing of this stuff. Um, you, it's very easy to predict over a long period, but you could be off by 10, 20, sort of 50 years, and unfortunately politicians are very focused on the period they're going to be in office. So. Um, I know I, it's a good, um, great idea to look at if China's doing anything different because they certainly um, are able to just mobilize huge parts of the workforce towards a certain thing. Um, haven't heard of anything yet on that front, though. Well, Jessica, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you all for coming out, and we really appreciate your input. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.